All right, we are excited to be joined by Kansas City Chiefs President Mark Donovan here on NFL Kickoff Week. The Chiefs are, of course, hosting the Baltimore Ravens Thursday night to open the 2024 season. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, great to be with you today. Excited to get the season kicked off, and it's nice to sit and chat with you first. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's certainly a busy week uh, for you all in Kansas City, but you do have some experience opening the NFL season as defending Super Bowl champions. Uh, what are the Chiefs doing off the field this week specifically, and is there anything you've learned from the previous years to kind of improve on this experience? Well, I'll start with what we're doing this week. Um, you know, kicking off the NFL season is big for every team every year. Obviously, when you get the opportunity to be the epicenter of football on Thursday night, um, we try to both appreciate that and take full advantage of it. Um, we have a longstanding tradition here in Kansas City where we launch Red Fridays. So every Friday during the season, we actually celebrate by the entire town turns red. So everybody wears red all day long. It's, it's our way of uniting the community. Um, with the Thursday night game for the past few years, we've been able to change Red Friday to Red Wednesday. Sure. So it's an exciting opportunity for us to celebrate with the entire region um, around Red Wednesday. Uh, what we've done with it um, is over the years, we've developed a fundraising opportunity that benefits our local Ronald McDonald Charities um, program. And over the last 10 years, we've raised over $5.5 million just on that one day um, leading into the season. So it's a great way for us to come together, celebrate and support a local community asset. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And just to kind of follow up on that there locally, I mean, what kind of business successes have you had or have you been able to capitalize from these last two Super Bowls? What does that translate it to? Well, it's been a long um, term strategy for us. Um, we talked a lot about this in 2009, 10, 11, when, you know, we weren't real successful in the football field and mm -hmm. frankly, we weren't real successful off the football field. And what we tried to do strategically is put ourselves in a position uh, to be able to capitalize on that success. So we talked about, you know, prepare for success, pre be ready for when you have success. You know, one of the interesting things about the business of sport and the business of the NFL and specifically on the franchise side is your success is somewhat limited or expanded by the success of your football team on the field. It makes perfect sense. It's logic. What we focused on was get ready for that success. Be prepared with the people, the process. You need to get fully prepared so that when this wave hits of success on the field, you're running at full steam. And looking back, that was probably one of the most beneficial things that we did as an organization is we got ready for it. Now, it's, it's also a little bit inspiring internally because you start to believe in those tough seasons when you're not winning football games, and, you know, everything is hard. You're putting in the work, you're putting in the time, you're setting up the process so that when you do have success, you're able to take on that. Um, that wave. And um, that's been what's really benefited us. Now, obviously, we've had a long success run here recently, mm -hmm. three of the last five Super Bowls. Um, I think looking back again, having that preparation and being able to take on this because every season is a new challenge. Um, yeah. With success comes its own problems and its own opportunities. And we were able to deal with the issues and we we're able to capitalize on the opportunities. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to share any specifics, I mean, like what, what are we talking about as far as like season ticket sales or revenue there or corporate hospitality? I mean, I'm sure the demand has to be very high coming off back to back Super Bowls. Yeah. I, I think our, I'll start with our ticketing team. Um, you know, we, we really wrap ticketing into biz, business development. So we have ticketing premium uh, club seats as well as suites. Um, so it's, it's trying to take a look at each one of those segments and then segment them further down. So one of the things we did early on in our success run was we started to identify segments of the market that we felt like we didn't have a product for. So on the premium side, you've got a, a suite, you've got a good club seat, you've got an okay club seat, and then you got really good season tickets or you know general admission tickets. And what we found was there were a couple gaps in there that we could create a product for. Hmm. 
and capitalize on that success and the demand that was growing. Um, and that started with building two additional clubs within our club level. So think about the prospect of you got a club level seat holder who now is looking at, well, I've got all the club assets. I've got access to everything I need, but they built a new club inside the club that I want to be a part of. So we sold two of those out in the first season. Now, since then, and this started in about 2018, 19, uh, since then, we've added eight new premium opportunities to our building. So various levels, um, back to that segmentation point, like we looked at where's the market, can we go higher end, is it, is it more general uh, marketplace? And it's been a real big boon for our business on the premium side. On the ticketing side, we've done a lot more strategically with data management. Um, obviously, demand has skyrocketed for our games. And how do you take advantage of that? How do you continue to provide a great opportunity for every fan at every level, back to that segmentation point, but also capitalize on the demand that you have? Um, so our ticketing team is one of the most sophisticated in the National Football League in terms of looking at the marketplace, understanding what the secondary market is doing. And a key component to that is the core belief that comes from Lamar Hunt, which is the season ticket member is the most important aspect of our business. We've got to do everything we can to enhance that fan's experience, to give them the best product that's out there. So from a pricing standpoint, what we try to do is make sure our season ticket members have the best economic deal that you can possibly have. And as our demand has raised, um, you know, we've got season ticket members who will come up to me and say, you know, I am a season ticket member. I've been for 50 years. I've been through all the ups and downs. It's amazing what's happening right now. But I got to tell you from an economic standpoint, it's a very expensive investment to be a prime seat location season ticket member. The reality is, and they're saying this to us, you know, I have two games I can't get to this year. If I put those on the secondary market through our internal program or outside of that program, I'm able to finance the majority of my season ticket yeah. member costs, right? So that's a byproduct of pricing your season ticket member price at a place where it is a big investment, but it's a really good value. And, and that's really what we focus on. Right. And, and then just last thing on ticketing, I mean, what's the strategy? Do you try to sell as many season tickets as possible or do you try to hold back that inventory so you can have a lot of single game tickets for those big matchups? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I think teams look at that differently. Uh, we're one of the more aggressive teams in making sure that we hit the season ticket member base, that number, mm -hmm. um, at a point where we ha have ac excess ca capacity so that we can leverage that opportunity on the single game ticket front. Um, you know, I, I know personally of a lot of teams that are out there that will sell 90 to 95, 99% of their tickets as season tickets we actually believe it's better to hold back um that number changes that season ticket base number changes each year and the reason it changes is we do a marketplace analysis of the value of the schedule so you look at there's high demands in our marketplace but look at the schedule and look at your incoming opponents the folks who are going to play at gha field and then you look at the market how the market sees those opponents and then you price those accordingly. Well, if you have enough excess inventory, you're able to capitalize on that opportunity. Now, there are certain years when your in-stadium uh, uh, opponent may not be as strong, where you actually sell more season tickets. Hmm. Benefit back again to that season ticket member being the key is that season ticket member who got in as a season ticket member that year, that ticket may not have been available the year before yeah. because yeah. it was held back. Now they're in. And they can renew and continue on, and they have the best investment in, from a ticketing standpoint in the market. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, Mark, kind of transitioning to some other big news from the NFL uh, last week, uh, you know, around private equity. Now, uh, private equity ownership is allowed in the NFL. Obviously, Chiefs owner Clark Hunt was a big proponent of getting that approved, but I know he said the Chiefs specifically are not really exploring that option right now. Can you just expand any at all on? why that's the case and what the next steps might be for a franchise like Kansas City to potentially consider private equity? 
Yeah, you touched on a lot there. So let me try to tick off um, a couple points that I think should be made. Number sure. one, the entire committee, that whole ownership group, which Clark was a big part of, uh, put an enormous amount of work in on this process. Uh, it was over a year long process and I think it extends far beyond that. <laughs> But it was real work. I saw it firsthand because you know, Clark would always be in these committee meetings um, on a pretty consistent basis. And these were not short meetings. And that just goes to the relevance of this issue for the National Football League. This is a big step for the league. Um, I personally believe it's a classic example of what makes this league so successful. It's taking a very measured approach on the opportunity to make sure that you're capitalizing on it, but not creating issues at the same time. And I think what this process has done and the policy that's been approved is it creates a great opportunity to have a very measured process that allows a diverse group of investors with institutional capital to be able to invest in our league. Um, I think it does it in a way that's controlled, that creates great opportunity and Every franchise is going to look at this differently. As Clark has said publicly, we're probably not one that's going to take advantage of this in the short term. It's, but it is something that you know other teams and other franchises will be in different positions, have different uh, objectives, and it just creates that opportunity. The last point I'll make on that is that you know this is not new to sports. This is something that's been utilized in other other leagues. But the key for us is we created a policy and a system that not only capitalizes, but strengthens the long-term policy that has made this league so successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. And I think some teams will get in on this quickly. And there's been a lot of ideas tossed around about what teams might do with that capital once they get some money from private equity. Uh, one of those yeah. is potentially use that money to help uh, with the stadium project. Uh, yeah. The Chiefs are obviously one of those teams, several teams looking to upgrade their current home. So just generally speaking, what do you think about the idea of bringing in that capital, five, 10% stake in the team, you get several hundred million dollars and putting a large chunk of it towards the stadium project, whether it's for the Chiefs or anybody else? Yeah, I think it goes back to the, the flexibility of this process and this policy is that it provides that opportunity for clubs. So certain clubs are going to do it for other reasons. Certain clubs are gonna look at it as a way to help finance their investment, whether it's stadium or something else. Um, and it's something that we will look at in the future. Um, but every franchise structure, ownership structure is a little different too. Every franchise ownership objectives are different. So it, it basically just becomes a tool for franchises to be able to leverage the value increase that's happened or along the NFL. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Mark, speaking on this stadium topic, uh, for looking to upgrade Arrowhead stadium, or potentially find a new home. Um, can you just give an update on where the Chiefs stand heading into week one of the NFL season? Yeah, as briefly as possible. I think uh, just for perspective, you know, we went out with the Kansas City Royals and tried to extend the existing sales tax that we have last April. Uh, it was a joint effort. There was, um, it, it's a complicated process for one team to do it. Sure. It's even more complicated with two teams. Add on to that, that one team was moving locations and one team was staying in location. So there were just a lot of variables there that I think impacted the success of that program. It did not pass um, all along in the process and, be, and during the process and then after the process. We had talked about, you know, that's our first option. We'd like to pursue this option. We've got a great partnership with Jackson County that, that sales tax comes from. It's worked. We've delivered against that that. Uh, that benefit that we've received. So we'd like to pursue that. If it doesn't work, then we've got to look at all of our options. The reality for our situation is that our lease expires in 2031. So in January, February of 2031, we're going to need a place to play that next season. If you do that timeline, then you know you look at you're renovating a stadium, it's four or five years, you're building a new stadium with infrastructure and new site and everything else, it's probably five or six years. To do it right, you could do it in a compressed time frame, but that comes with its own issues. So what we've tried to do since April is identify what all the options are and have discussions, productive discussions uh, on both sides of the state line. We're in a situation where um, we literally are 
the Chiefs Kingdom includes both Kansas and Missouri. Um, so we've had great discussions with the state of Kansas. They took some pretty significant action and actually elevated the benefits around an existing program called Star Bonds, which would be um, utilized to help finance a new facility. So that would be a new stadium in the state of Kansas. And then in Missouri, you know, even during the process of the vote and after the process of the vote, the, con the conversations continued with the state of Missouri, both Jackson County, the city of Kansas City, and the state of Missouri on how we can renovate and make Arrowhead last yeah. even longer. Um, so those conversations continue um, as of the last week. Um, so we recently had our kickoff um, breakfast um, with basically all of the business leaders in Kansas yeah. City. So it's a long-term um, tradition. And it's the first time we've had governors from both the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri at that event. And I think that shows the, the value that people are putting on the Kansas City Chiefs as a franchise and the opportunity to you know, either renovate and expand on the success of this iconic stadium at GHA Field or build a brand new stadium. And I think the one thing that that also proves, and I think those people who are in the room know, is that the economic impact of any National Football League franchise is significant on the region. For us, back to your first question of how we've expanded on the success of the team, you know, last year we had a billion dollar economic impact on the state of Missouri and the region of Kansas City. That's a significant business. That generates a significant amount of tax revenue that goes to the state, the city, the county. So those are things that we deliver as part of being a part of this community. So those two governors and those two organizations, the state organizations, the county organizations, they look at this and they, they see real value. So where we are is we're evaluating our options. Um, we're, we're in the process and it's a pretty, um, you know, we're, we're pretty far along in the process, I would say. Um, and we, we like our options. So we just gotta figure out what makes the most sense for our fans, what makes the most sense for this organization and what makes the most sense for the future. Mark, within the organization, obviously stadium projects are hard for anybody across the country, across any sports, but has this particular one in Kansas City been a distraction at all for the team? It try, it's trying to capitalize on that success of being two-time defending Super Bowl champions. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that really shows the success of this franchise, and it's the structure. Um, Clark Hunt did a great job of saying, I want to put leaders in place, empower them to do their jobs, um, and make sure that the leaders in place all respect each other and appreciate why we're here. So, you know, myself as the president, our head coach, Andy Reid, and our general manager, Brett Beach, we all report to Clark. We all have our stated responsibilities, but the reality is there's overlap every single day. Um, you know, Brett does an amazing job with talent evaluation and players and um, the draft and salary cap and everything else. Coach does a Hall of Fame level. Uh, job at the head coaching job. I'm just trying to keep up with those two. Um, but the reality is that to your question, part of the job is to make sure that we're eliminating those distractions. Mm -hmm. So while the stadium process and the stadium vote process was all encompassing for me and members of my team, it did not impact them. They were not part of it. You know, we weren't really updating them on a weekly basis. I would ask, answer the questions when they asked because it was a big news story. But our job is to eliminate that distraction from the football team. And that just goes back to, you know, the direction that Clark has given us is we're a football team. Our goal is to win games and consistently compete for championships. Let's just make sure everybody's working towards that goal. Now, at the same time, we have this amazing opportunity to expand our business because of the success of this franchise. Let's make sure we all remember that winning football games is what really gives us those opportunities. And that's really what's driven us. Yeah, yeah. So obviously that's all kind of like future planning, 2020, 2031, et cetera. As we head back to this season, um, there's no denying that last year the Chiefs were at the center of the effect that Taylor Swift had on the NFL. Uh, her and Travis Kelsey are obviously still going strong. Has the organization done anything this offseason just to brace for that impact again? Um, I wouldn't say brace for it. Um, I think it's a, an amazing story. Um, you got two really, really special people in the middle of this historic opportunity, right? To win a third Super Bowl in a row. Um, 
I will say this about Taylor and Travis. Um, one of the reasons that I think they are so um, impactful to the entire world, um, but specifically to the Kansas City region and even more specifically to Chiefs Kingdom, mm -hmm. they're, they're both really authentic. And one of the things you learn in Kansas City is if you're not authentic, it doesn't work. People see through it. And if you are authentic, they will embrace you. And that has happened with both of them, obviously, through Travis's career, um, but also so recently with Tra um, Taylor becoming a member of the kingdom. And, th and that's how we look at it, is we're excited that she's an authentic Chiefs fan and that she's authentically a part of this community. And we've adopted her in Chiefs kingdom. Um, now, with Taylor, she brings a lot with her. <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty valuable targeted demographic when you look at the makeup of her fan base. Um, and we've looked at ways that we can be respectful. Sure. I had a great conversation with, with Travis the first game that Taylor came to. Hmm. Um, this was prior to the game. Um, and I grabbed Pat Travis after practice and just said, hey, I'm hearing through the grapevine that uh, Taylor's coming to the game. Uh, he said, yeah, she wants to come to the game. That's on her. I'm going to focus on the game. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, it's Taylor Swift. So yeah. we sort of have to plan for this and make sure we, we've got a plan for her. We're going to take her through these certain entrances and you know, make sure that she's safe and make sure that we manage the crowd reaction. Um, and Travis's response was, she wants to come as a fan. She doesn't want all this stuff. Deal with her. I'm playing football. <clears throat> and I was like, okay, but you know, she can't come through the main gate. That's not going to work. <laughs> and he said, no, she wants to come through the main gate like a fan. I'm like, Travis, I'm like, that, I, that can't happen. And uh, so we had this entire intricate plan. Her security team came the day before. We had this great way of getting her in and out. Everything was going to be great. You know, you know, not unlike we do with other BVIPs. Yeah. So the day of the game, I get a call from our head of security saying, uh, Taylor doesn't like the plan. She's coming through the main gate. <laughs> And she did. Um, she, you know, put on a hat and uh, a COVID mask and some sunglasses and brought a group of people and they all came right through the main gate. Um, because that's what she wants. She wants to be a fan, right? This is her off time. She wants to be there and support Travis. Um, and we're going to cre create that opportunity. We're going to provide that opportunity. The last point I'll make on Taylor, and this is another conversation we had with Travis, was we did our very best to respect the relationship, sure. right? Right. So, you know, every week you see every single game broadcast that we have, they're looking for Taylor. Um, we made a conscious decision to respect the relationship. Yeah. Um, not unlike any other player um, and their relationship. And uh, I think it's, it's telling that, you know, we conscious decision to the point of last season in Arrowhead Stadium and GHA Field, we didn't play a single Taylor Swift song during your games and that that was a shine a sign of respect like yeah. this is, we're not trying to capitalize on this we're trying to celebrate it but it's not about you know doing too much or showing her every touchdown or anything like that um, she never appeared on our big board um, we had one day when we had you know six or seven big celebrities uh, in the stadium and so prior to the game you know we show them on the sideline and put them on the big board and the fans react and it's it's a another way of saying like this is the place to be the coolest people in entertainment are here too and i went to travis afterwards and i'm like it's a little odd to me that we showed like four hollywood people two entertainers a comedian and taylor's in her suite watching but we're not showing her <laughs> he's like let's just keep doing it the way we're doing it so yeah well, no, that's that's all great. And so, I mean, just by judging all that, I know she has, I mean, the Chiefs have like three home games, I think, before her tour picks back up. They love supporting each other. Sounds like you're probably not even making changes to your security or luxury suite area. Sounds like you guys have that all handled. Yeah, we've got a great process and uh, and uh, we'll be prepared for her and uh, obviously welcome with open arms. Yeah. So Thursday night, Chiefs Ravens kick off the season. Friday night, Packers Eagles are going to play in Brazil. Um, yeah latest move for inter international expansion for the NFL. I know last season the Chiefs played in Germany for the first time. It was a huge success. Um, you know, are you hoping to get back to Germany next season or what, what are the Chiefs thinking internationally to expand that fan base? Yeah, we'd love to play internationally again. Um, I think that <clears throat> we, amongst other teams, were some of the early adopters 
of the international opportunity and we were really aggressive. We just felt it was an amazing opportunity to expand your fan base, develop new business relationships, um, and experience something um, that would hopefully have a positive benefit on your team. And we were able to accomplish, fortunately, we were able to accomplish all three of those. Um, I will say this, um, you know, we got in early on the international uh, opportunity and we focused on Germany and Mexico as our two markets. And we looked at Germany as probably the place we wanted to play a game first. Um, we wanted to be the first game in Germany. Um, we weren't, um, we were the second year, um, but it gave us a year, almost two years of preparation, going back to that prepare for success. We, we took the same approach to Germany. Is that how can we develop the relationships? How can we create business relationships leading into a potential game? And then when the game comes, let's be ready to invest in it. Let's be ready to really uh, invest in resources, people, time, um, and marketing expertise. And, and we spent uh, over a million dollars in investing, investing in that game weekend in Frankfurt. And I would say that it's paid off significantly for us, both in fan reach. We created a lot of fans. We created this opportunity for our fans who were going over to have an experience. Um, and just it solidified ourselves in the business community in Frankfurt and Germany. Um, we've done a really good job of maximizing that and optimizing that on the sponsorship side. I think we're either first or second in terms of revenue generated internationally uh, from sponsorship deals. And then, you know, we, we had a lot of really good, I think four or five multi-year corporate partnerships with German brands around the Frankfurt game, which makes sense leading into the game and then beyond the game. I think a real show of strength for us and back to justifying that investment we made was we just recently announced our largest international partnership with Wagner Pizza. Um, and it starts now going forward. And we don't have another game in Germany um, in any time in the near future. One of the challenges with playing again in Germany is, you know, a lot of teams have seen the success that we and other franchises have had and everybody's getting in line to play. Right. And the way the league works, you know, if you haven't played internationally, you're going to be in front of us to play mm -hmm. again. Um, but we'll keep pushing that envelope and hopefully get out, get over to Europe again soon. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Mexico in there, Mark. Uh, the Chiefs were supposed to play a game in Mexico City pre-COVID that got canceled <laughs> against the Rams. How do you just balance getting back to Mexico, getting back to Germany and, you know, marketing in both of those countries at the same time? Yeah, I think we would look at international opportunities pretty agnostically. Um, ideally, we'd favor a little bit going back to Germany um, because we spent so much time and effort there. Um, but if we had the opportunity to go to Mexico City or another city in Mexico, we would absolutely take it. Um, the difference there, again, is that you got a pretty crowded marketplace there in terms of other NFL brands that have invested or are in Mexico. Ironically, um, I think we first joined there were eight or nine teams that had Mexican rights. Um, and there were only four teams that had German rights. I think that's flipped now. And there are eight or nine teams in Germany, in addition to the eight or nine teams in Mexico. So, you know, that the strategic approach of, okay, well, where can we have the biggest impact is, is, um, is dwarfed a little bit right now because uh, there are just so many more teams that are taking advantage of this opportunity. Right. Okay, well, Mark, this has been great as we kind of wrap up here one more back on the field, um, trying to do a historic three-peat right this offseason for the Chiefs. A lot of a big contract signed, whether it's Andy Reid or several positions becoming the highest paid player at their position. Obviously, some of that takes ownership approval um, for the other side of the front office. Um, can you just speak on, is it kind of this feeling of let's invest in the team now while this huge Super Bowl window is, is open? Uh, I think that's part of it. I think that... Um... You know, Clark's mandate to us and specifically to coach and to Brett Beach, our GM, was consistently compete for championships. So, you know, if you really take that apart, it's being consistent, but it's being consistent at this really high level, which is really difficult. So you're making hard decisions every year on what are you going to do with contracts and how do you extend the right guys, making sure you're doing it at the right time. I think that Brett Beach and his team have done an amazing job of that. The collaboration between Brett and Andy and the entire coaching staff is probably um, one of the more impressive things about our organization is our coaches are involved with our GM on, you know, players and evaluations as well as, you know, opportunities that we look at. 
So I think that um, you know, we're going to continue down the path of trying to make sure we keep the core together um, and try to add where we can and when we can. Um, last season was a great example of that with some key players coming in and making serious contributions to our Super Bowl wins. This year, I think we've done it again. Um, and again, Brett and his team deserve all the credit for that. Excited about the opportunity to go and make some history. Um, I think it's one of the cooler things about training camp this year was the players and coaches approach to this season is, is consistent with that is this is an amazing opportunity and let's go do everything we possibly can to take advantage of it. And less of the, you know, everybody talks about, you know, the stress and the pressure of, you know, being in a position like this. We, we look at it and I know this team looks at it differently. They look at it as, you know, we worked really hard to be in this position. Let's go take advantage of it and work even harder to accomplish it. So I guess that on the business side, you're able to just kind of lean into that. I mean, are there any specific plans for, I mean, don't want to get ahead of yourself with a three-peat talk, right? But it sounds like you're really leaning into that rather than saying, don't even talk about it. Yeah, you can't ignore it, right? So we, we have been pretty um, aggressive and strategic on how can we utilize this opportunity. Um, but I think it's important to point out that in all of those conversations, we do an evaluation of will this create a distraction and how can we limit the distraction to our football team? And that's an important point for us as an organization. I mean, you can imagine the opportunities that have come across our desk since last year hmm. are significant. Um, and, and you've got to take a measured approach to that. We've got to take advantage of the right ones. We got to, we got to execute them the right way. Um, but we also have to turn down a lot. And um, some of it just, you know, some of it's easy, like that's gonna be a huge distraction. We're not in the market for that. Some of it's more difficult, it's nuanced, like could we actually do it this way? Um, and then some of them, you know, have been really exciting for us to be able to say, okay, we probably wouldn't be in this position to have this opportunity. Let's go do this and do it right. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot already. Um, I think just as an example, you know, last year going into the playoffs, we. We created this playoff promotion called Tis the Season. And it was our way and Laura Kruger and our CMO, they really deserve the credit of like coming with, coming together and trying to create something that capitalizes on the playoffs for us. We've been in the playoffs so consistently, like it's become sort of our season. And so they combined that with a holiday theme. They actually branded it, kind of branded it around the Hallmark um, holiday theme movies and created this, this movie promo that was really tied around promoting playoffs. And even, I think the second or third time I watched it, I said, you know, this could be sort of <laughs> like Ted Lasso, right? Yeah. Ted Lasso was created to promote Premier Soccer on NBC. And then I was like, well, let's just make a show out of it. And, uh, you know, we've already started shooting and, it'll, you know, I know it's been announced that Hallmark is going to actually do a film now. Um, based on that promotion, a little bit different story, but based on the promotion, and that's an opportunity. That, like, hey, we can take advantage of that. We we can leverage that, and we can do it in a way that doesn't distract from the football team. So that's the kind of opportunity we're trying to take advantage of. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Hallmark and Netflix uh, this holiday season is where you can find the Chiefs, right? Yeah. Um, Mark, thanks so much uh, being for so generous with your time here on a busy week for you and the Chiefs organization. So we enjoyed it. Best of luck Thursday in this season. We're excited to uh, kick things off. All right. Thanks. Good to be with you. Thanks.